So as we all know, the question for today, uh, for today's event, is Houston, where do we go from here? And based on my life's work, which is teaching mindfulness meditation, I pose the question, where are we now? Now, I can relate to the spirit of both of these questions, the spirit of this goal orientation and the spirit of the moment. I'm a busy business owner, and on the other side of this kind of, that kind of future-oriented, I'm also, uh, I meditate every day and I sit in 10-day uh, silent meditation retreats. So today we'll talk about the different, these two different orientations. So as I said, I teach mindfulness meditation. And mindfulness is the awareness that arises when we bring a compassionate, open-hearted, non-judgmental attention to the moment. It's about being in the here and now. It's not about getting anywhere. So I heard a hmm over here, yeah. <laughs> so mindfulness includes intention. It helps us to know why we're doing what we're doing. It includes attention, which is, which is absolutely crucial for any process. We need to pay attention. It also includes a certain attitude. Uh, in mindfulness meditation or mindfulness in general, we cultivate the attitude of kindness and compassion toward our own experience as well as toward others. As we bring non-judgmental attention to the present moment, we end up being a little more able to allow our experience to be just as it is without trying to struggle with it too much. And mindfulness has been likened to a bird that needs two wings to fly. And mindfulness needs awareness and compassion. So this kind of awareness, this mindful awareness, has a lot to do with um, not only where we go from here, but how we get there. So let's consider a study uh, that comes from, the, from uh, Columbia University. And in this study, researchers would walk up to somebody on the, on the campus of uh, Columbia University, and they would ask a subject for directions to a particular building. So the researcher is here, the subject is here. Meanwhile, as the person is giving directions to the building, two people with a door, carrying a door walk between the subject and the researcher, momentarily uh, obscuring the, the subject's view of the researcher. The researcher steps out, and another person steps in. Okay? The door passes on between, from between them. Only 30% of the people who, who were the subjects actually knew that the person was a different one. <laughs> Okay, this is, this is scary, right? This is scary. So this study says a lot about how we pay attention and that the goal-drivenness of our, our, the way that we, well, our goal-drivenness may keep us from noticing something really important about what's happening. So how does that affect where we're going and how we get there? One of the ways is that unless we know clearly where we are right now, we don't know how to get anywhere, okay? So if we're perpe perpetually in the future, we miss out on a lot. First off, we miss out on our own lives. Mary Oliver, who's a wonderful poet, I, if you don't know her, look her up, she uh, is wonderful. She describes her desire to be fully present in these words. When it's over, I want to say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was a bridegroom holding the world in my arms. The difficulty of not living in the moment is indicated by Mark Twain who said, uh, I'm an old man. I've lived through a lot of stuff, a lot of difficulty, some of which actually happened. <laughs> So when we're not in the present, we live in some imagined future event that may well not happen. So these quotes, I hope, indicate the importance of being present in the moment. When I teach my classes, 
one of the first things that we do is to eat two raisins. We take about 10 or 15 minutes to eat two raisins and we do it with mindful awareness, with what's called a beginner's mind. And when, when people do this, they notice amazing things about objects as common as raisins. So there's a, um, there's a cultural anthropologist named Angeles Arians. She has a lot to say, I think, about these two, uh, two spirits, the spirit of the future and the spirit of the present. She studied indigenous cultures, and what she found was that all culture, all indigenous cultures share in common four ways of leading, four principles of leading um, a, a good life. So the first, the very first principle is to show up. You got to come to the dance if you want to dance. About 20 years ago, my husband and I were watching a PBS special called uh, Healing in the Mind with Bill Moyers. It showed John Kabat-Zinn, the founder of the Stress Reduction Clinic at UMass Medical Center, University of Massachusetts Medical Center, teaching mindfulness meditation. And in those moments, I was so struck that I had this deep sense of knowing that this was what I wanted to do. Not wanted to do, I had to do it. So at that time, I felt very poor and um, I felt like I couldn't afford it. One of my friends, Mary Meyerson, who I'm eternally grateful to, uh, when I told her I couldn't afford it, she said, maybe you can't afford not to. And so I showed up. So the next principle is to pay attention to what has heart and meaning. This opens us up, up to love, to gratitude, to compassion. We'll say more about this in a few minutes, okay? So we'll pass by. The third one um, is to tell the truth without blame or judgment. Now this is obviously very important. We, it shows our integrity. It opens us up to all sorts of, of other qualities. But in order to stick to my time slot and the, and the subject, we'll give this a little bit of a short, short, shrift, short shrift. So the fourth principle is to be open to outcome and not attached to outcome. When we're attached to an outcome, what happens is that we become reactive. We want to be there now, but we're here. We become anxious, okay? When we're not attached to outcome, when we're open, what can happen is that we go more with the flow of life. We become less reactive. So I'll tell a little story on myself as I prepare for a talk and I'm not, a, I'm not a public speaker, I'm, I'm a teacher, but I'm not a public speaker, and so these things are big to me, and I get attached to the outcome. I want to give a good talk. I want this to be the best, okay? All sorts of reactive thoughts, old things come into my mind. Oh, will I do a good job, blah, 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 right? Yada, 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 anybody know this? Yeah. So when this happens, I feel anxious, okay? When it happens, I can stop, I can bring my awareness into the present moment and notice my own suffering. I take a breath, I bring myself some compassion, and I remind myself to speak from my heart, and that in most senses, this really isn't even about me. This is about my job with a big J, my wanting to bring this to other people. And it reminds me of a quote uh, by a woman named Donna Markova from a poem. And she says, I choose to risk my significance, to live so that what, that which came to me as seed goes on as blossom, and that which came to me as blossom goes on as fruit. So mindfulness doesn't mean that we're never going to feel anxious again. It simply means that we can be present with it, that we can be kind to it, that we don't have to struggle so much with it, and then things move more quickly through us. Mindfulness practice can help us to live these four principles. Now, most of the time, we're not here. We're everywhere else. The body's in the shower, right? 
taking a shower. The mind is elsewhere. We're only vaguely conscious of any kind of experience of the shower, and we're probably only vaguely conscious and maybe, maybe being run by our own thoughts. Okay? But we're not really sure what's going on. So with mindfulness, what we do is to come into the moment and we notice when the mind begins to wonder. It gives us greater choice, first off, about where we place our attention. And that creates a greater sense of freedom about how we react to our wild and crazy thoughts. One of the things we also come to understand is that it really isn't our thoughts that make us crazy, it's how we relate to them. Okay, this is very important. Now there are two main practices, two main avenues of practice in mindfulness uh, practice. One is a, pract an, a formal practice of uh, mindfulness <clears throat> where we set time aside to meditate, kind of what you know, people usually think of, right? There's also an informal practice, one in which we bring our attention by coming to the breath first. We do this over and over and over and over during the day. <clears throat> we notice things uh, as simple as taking a sip of water. We notice things as some, something as simple as walking to our car from, the par from this building. And in doing that, we inhabit our own lives. We, we embody the, our own lives. We <clears throat> give it meaning. We also are training our minds to be present for when the wolf is at the door, when difficulty comes, because it's not so easy to be present then. So I'm reminded of the quote from uh, one of my teachers, John Kabat-Zinn, and he says, the only moment that we have is now. So we commit to living our lives as if they matter. Now mindfulness can also help us to find our own true uh, radiant nature and also our deepest intentions. Most of the time if we look beneath the surface of the mundane things in our lives, what we find is that most everything, we're, most everything is based in trying to find love and connection. And this sometimes gets buried, but all the more reason to be aware and awake. So mindfulness is also a non-striving practice in which we are not trying to make anything happen at all. Not trying to get anything, not trying to get anything, not trying to do anything. Simply being in the moment. <clears throat> and this gives us a, a sense it can give us a sense of less reactivity during the craziness of some of our days and also a place to rest in the midst of busyness. Many people think that when they meditate or when they, if they're going to try to meditate, I've got to clear my mind, I need to do something, I need to empty the mind, it needs to be this blank space. Not so. That may happen after a while, but if we try to get it, it doesn't happen. So we simply come to the breath, and when the mind wanders, ah, oh, we bring it back. Over and over and over again, that's the training. So let's talk for a few minutes about goal orientation. Obviously, we need goals. We're, we do have families, we do have jobs, we have lives that are filled with things that we need to do. We gotta pay the bills, right? So we make goals. They help us to be organized, they help us to make a living, they help us to <clears throat> uh, be effective in the world. We all know about this orientation. Okay. One of the problems is that if we focus on goal orientation to the, uh, just solely, it sets us up for a fair amount of suffering. One of the things that can happen is that we're never satisfied. <clears throat> We're, we're always, it's like we're always out here and we're not satisfied with this moment because we're not there yet. We haven't attained the goal yet. So in a sense, it's like the fellow on the mountain. We lean forward into our experience and this causes imbalance for us. So 
When we focus on intention, in addition to, f to focusing on goals, we, tend, we can alleviate some of the suffering that, that I've just talked about. We base our intentions on what is most deeply important to us. And then we align our, our activities in the world based on those intentions. Maybe intentions of love, compassion, integrity, openness, family. And when we have uh, intention as our guide, we live <clears throat> in the now and the flow of things rather than trying to make it the way we have to, we think it should be. And we get to know how we're being in the moment. And we get to live our lives as if they matter, as John Kabat-Zinn says. We may actually get to know something that happens now that may need to affect our strategy for how we get where we are going. So when we act from true intention, there's a paradox at work. Being in the here and now can help us to more effectively get where we're going. Instead of kind of reaching out into the future, we can do what's in the moment that's important. <clears throat> and we're less reactive than when we're in our own kind of desirous nature and our own kind of reactive nature and in, our, and our, in our insecurities. We simply don't get blown around by the winds of change. So with mindfulness meditation and, in, and living in intention, we don't just set them and then like set them aside. We live them day by day, moment by moment. And in the for, informal practice I mentioned coming back to the breath over and over again, when you do that you might remind yourself, what is my intention? What's important here? Okay. One of the things that I remind myself of is my intention to help people alleviate their own suffering and also to help myself alleviate mine. That's my job. And if I'm overtired, if I'm grumpy, if I feel kind of just overwrought, one of the things that I can do is to remind myself of, my, of what my values are and I feel less reactive to that, to, what it, to the other things. So when you practice mindfulness leading from intention, your happiness comes from the strength of your internal intention. And you become one of those really fortunate uh, human beings who know yourself, you know yourself. And you're a little bit more independent from culture's obsession with, with uh, self-satisfaction and with winning. So I'll leave you with two quotes and then, a, and then a piece of advice or a suggestion. The first quote is up on the screen. Ours is in the trying, the rest is not our business. By T.S. Eliot. And here's kind of a fierce, poem, a fierce quote from a Trappist monk named Thomas Merton. Do not depend on the hope of results. You may have to face the fact that your work will be apparently worthless and even, achieve, and even achieve no result at all, if not results opposite to what you expect. As you get used to this idea, you start more and more to concentrate, not on the results, but on the value and the truth of the work itself. You gradually struggle less and less for an idea and more and more for specific people. In the end, it is the reality of personal relationship that saves everything. So, as the day goes on, and I hope maybe after the day, after this day, into the future, um, that you experiment with mindfulness this paying attention in the moment with an open heart and an open mind. So today, pay attention, show up, take a breath. Pay attention, take a breath. Tell the truth, take a breath. 
be open to any outcome that comes today and take a breath. This might help you know where you go from here. Thank you.